What's going on guys? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be taking a look at the all new Odroid H2. This is Odroid's newest single board computer. It's powered by an Intel x86 CPU, so we have a lot of choices for operating systems. I have a lot of videos planned for the H2, but in this video I'm going to be running Windows 10 Pro. I'm going to go over the specs. I want to show you the cost of everything that I have here. And then we're going to run some benchmarks and test out some games and emulators. So the base package from Amerodroid or Hard Kernel comes just like you see it here. You get the board and an RTC battery. No power supply, nothing else included. The power supply is an additional $12. It's 15 volts, 4 amps, and you might not have a 15 volt one laying around, so you might as well order one if you're thinking about getting a board. Let's go ahead and jump right into the specs. For the CPU, we have a quad-core Intel Celeron J4105. This is a 14 nanometer CPU with four megabytes of cache. It will do up to 2.5 gigahertz single thread or 2.3 gigahertz multi-thread. Now this is a 10 watt CPU, but inside of the Odroid H2, it's set at 12 watts. And the GPU is an Intel UHD 600 up to 700 megahertz. This will do 4K video playback very well at 60 FPS. It's handled everything that I've been able to throw at it. Checking out the IO, we have two gigabit ethernet ports up top, a 15 volt DC power jack, two USB 2.0 ports, two USB 3.0 ports, a single display port 1.2, a full size HDMI 2.0, it will do 4K 60 hertz out. And finally, wrapping it up on this side, one 3.5 millimeter audio in, one 3.5 millimeter audio out, and optical audio. Swinging around to the top of the board, we have a power switch, a reset switch, an expansion header, it's 20 pin, so it's a 20 pin GPIO, active cooling fan connector, it does not come with a fan that is sold separately, two SATA 3 6 gig data connectors and two SATA power connectors, so we can have two SATA drives on here. We can use 2.5, we could use 3.5 mechanical, or even some SSDs. And again, the wiring connectors for these are also sold separately. And finally, we have one EMMC socket, so you can run your entire operating system off of this if you'd like to. But flipping the board over reveals an M.2 NVMe slot. Now this is PCIe 2.0 X4, but it only accepts NVMe SSDs. It won't work with a regular cheap M.2. I read this on the website, but I did test it out myself using a cheaper silicone power M.2 SSD, non-NVMe, and sure enough, the system will not detect it. And finally, two DDR4 SODIMM slots. So you will have to provide your own RAM here. It will do up to 32 gigabytes, and it only accepts DDR4. Speaking of adding your own RAM and storage, I'm using eight gigabytes DDR4 ballistic RAM. This was actually on sale a while ago, so I bought two kits. And for my storage, I'm using a Western Digital Black 256 gigabyte NVMe M.2 drive. I could have definitely got out cheaper if I wanted to use a 2.5 inch SATA SSD, but I didn't want a big old SATA drive hanging off the side of this thing. I also wanted to add Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Now this isn't necessary because it has some good ethernet on it, but if you wanna go wireless, you will have to pick up an adapter. I know everybody's thinking about the price right now. The Odroid H2 is $111 without a power supply. Power supply is 15. So calculating the total cost of everything that I'm gonna be using in this video, the H2 is 111, the power supply is 15, the Wi-Fi is 10, Bluetooth modules are five. The eight gigabytes of ballistic DDR4 was $60. A 256 gigabyte NVMe SSD was 85, bringing my total cost up to $286. You can get out cheaper, not adding Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. You got the H2 for 111, the power supply for 15, cheap eight gigabytes of no name DDR4 RAM, 5150 right now on Amazon, cheapest I could find, and a no name 128 gigabyte NVMe SSD for 27. Now these are the cheapest parts that I could find on Amazon and new egg right now. It'll bring your total up to $204. So with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and check performance. Is this gonna be worth it? Like I mentioned, I'm gonna be running Windows 10. Now they do recommend Linux for this, but I'm gonna tell you right now that if you wanna do gaming or emulation, it's gonna work better in Windows 10. Intel designs its chips around Windows, and that's basically how it is. Drivers are gonna have better support with Windows. Plus, with a lower end GPU like this, we do have support for DirectX 11, and a lot of emulators have DirectX 11 support in Windows and not Linux. This chip does have Vulkan support in Linux and Windows, but it's just not powerful enough to justify using Vulkan all the time. 
DirectX 11 is going to beat that out in 99% of the applications you're going to run. All right, so here we are, Windows 10 Pro. It's a fresh install. I went ahead and ran Cinebench. It's about to finish up here. This is my second run on it. I did let the CPU cool down a little bit. And it looks like we scored a 257, which has nothing on higher end chips, but we did beat out a third generation mobile i5 CPU, but overall not horribly bad for a quad core 12 watt CPU. The next benchmark I ran was Geekbench. For the single core, we scored a 1916 for multi-core 5,866. Now I have seen the multi-core hit 6,000 using Linux, but that's a benchmark. Benchmarks are benchmarks, Real-world performance is real-world performance. I'm actually surprised at the multi-core score here. I thought we were going to be in the low 4000s. Moving over to some native 4K video playback. Same test I always run on all of these. One of the hardest ones here, Big Buck Bunny, 60 FPS, MP4. I can't tell you how many ARM chips struggle with this. The manufacturers claim 4K 60 FPS and it just can't handle this file here. I did bring up the frame rate at the very top. We'll see if we have any drop frames. And it looks like CPU usage is anywhere from 10% up to 36. No trouble with this file. I was pretty sure it was going to handle it. These Intel chips do really good decoding 4K. Zero drop frames. Constant 60 FPS. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. So the H2 is handling this 4K video better than the Nvidia Shield does. Now the Shield does a great job, but we do have a few drop frames here and there. Let's test one more. We don't even need to do the 30 since 60 work. Jellyfish 120 megabits per second, 4K HEVC 10 bit MKV. This is a 30 FPS video, no drop frames. It's going to handle it fine. So you shouldn't have any trouble playing most 4K content on the H2. Let's check out some YouTube 4K streaming. Pretty sure it's going to work fine as long as you get a good connection. I am using that wireless adapter that you saw at the beginning. It is AC. Zero drop frames. If you want to watch 4K Netflix, Hulu, YouTube, this SBC is going to handle it perfectly. Next up, some Steam games. This is Dead Cells, and unfortunately, the sound does not work with this game for some reason on these Celeron chips. I tried on the N5000 and the J4105. Always had trouble with it. V-Sync is off, so you will see some screen tearing. If I do turn V-Sync on, it'll lock at a constant 30. The game's fully playable. And in all of these tests, I do have Afterburner running, so it's going to be up in the top left-hand corner. We have the GPU usage. CPU temperature and usage, memory usage, and the frame rate. I do recommend putting a small fan on here. Through all of these tests, I did not have a fan, but I did go into the BIOS and I changed the thermal throttle to 100 degrees Celsius. I completely understand that that's really hot, but if it's going to die, I'm going to kill it now. So the way it's set up right now, it will not hit thermal throttle until that CPU hits 100 degrees Celsius. Here's Overwatch, 720p, low settings, we get an average of around 31 FPS. It's not bad at all. I see some dips every once in a while with some heavy fire, and that CPU is getting hot, but we're not hitting that thermal throttle. So adding a fan right now, like I have mine set up, will not increase performance. It will increase the lifespan of the CPU because we're not going to get it so hot, but you're not going to get any better frame rate cooling it down. Older Valve Source games like Left 4 Dead 2 run really good. This is on high settings, 720p. If you drop it down to low, you could probably get a constant 60, or you could just leave it on high like I have, turn on V-Sync, and get a constant 30 out of it. The game plays fine at 30 FPS. CSGO Source, I didn't even mess with the settings, we're well over 100 FPS, you'll be fine playing this.
I did try PUBG. I'm on the lowest of the low settings. We can go at 720p. Only in the lobby, maximum 18 FPS. It's just not going to be playable. I know everybody's going to be asking about Fortnite, but you can't even start the Epic Launcher with this CPU. For some reason, I don't know if it's blocked. The N4000, the N4100, and the J4105, the Epic Launcher just won't start. Moving over to some emulation, this is Dolphin running Super Smash Bros. Melee. Using the DirectX 11 backend, I'm at native resolution, don't have any hacks on, runs fine. Constant 60, you will have some dips every once in a while when shader cache is loading. And this is one of my go-to tests, this is Soul Calibur 2 for GameCube running in the Dolphin emulator. Really nice performance. Dreamcast using ReDream, almost at 1080p. The settings won't provide a true 1080p, but it still looks amazing and runs fine on this. In Soul Calibur for Dreamcast, still using ReDream, same settings. You're going to have a great time playing Dreamcast using ReDream on the H2. As long as the game is compatible with the emulator, it's going to play to full speed. Next up, PSP. I'm using PPSSPP 1.7.4. This is Crash Racing. FPS is in the top right hand corner. No speed hacks for this game and 3x resolution. And finally, God of War Chains of Olympus. This is using the DirectX 11 back in. It does perform better than Vulkan or OpenGL on this CPU, but we still got stutters. I do have one of the speed hacks on, splines are set to low, and we're at 2x native resolution. It's just really something about this game. If you don't have a beefy CPU, it just can't get over some of the shortcomings with this emulator. So overall, PSP is gonna perform really well on here. Some games are gonna be able to run it one-to-one. -one. Some are gonna have to drop down to 2X. Don't expect to run Killzone or Midnight Club over 2X resolution. You might even have to go down to 1X for Killzone. My initial thoughts, I mean, it's a nice little mini PC. They sell a ton of these on Amazon with the same chip that have RAM pre-installed for about $160 to $190. And the support you're going to get with those is pretty much non-existent after you buy them, so be careful unless you buy an Intel NUC. Speaking of the NUC, I recently did a review on the Bean Canyon i5 version, and it blows this out of the water. Yes, you're going to spend more money, but it is much more powerful. For instance, multi-core Geekbench on this board right here does almost 6,000 in Windows. The Bean Canyon, 16,000. It's definitely a jump in price, but it's a big jump in performance also. I will need a little more time before I give you my final thoughts on this board. I'm going to test out a bunch of different operating systems and I'll make a lot of videos. I'm going to test out Botocera, Laka, RetroPie. I'll go with some other Linux distributions and I'll even throw Android on here. One thing I've been trying to do is get an external GPU to work off of an M.2 to PCI X4 adapter. Not sure if it's going to or not because this is only detects NVMe hardware and that right there should have been avoided in the first place. We should have been able to use regular old M.2 SSDs in the slot. It would be a lot cheaper for some people. We could get more storage at a better deal. Plus, I'd already have an external GPU running on this thing. I was able to do it with the new Latte Panda Alpha and several of my Chinese NUC clones and single board computers that run x86 CPUs. Now I know I'm going to get this question in the comments. Will it run Crisis? I actually tried to install it from my Steam account, that's where I purchased it from, and it told me that I had it installed on too many PCs, so I can't install it on anything else. So that's pretty much it for this video guys. Let me know what you want to see running on this board. I will make several more videos. Don't forget, I already mentioned I will run RetroPie, Botticera, Laka. I'll do Recall Box. I'll do all of that. I just need a little time to get everything recorded. So that's pretty much it for this video, guys. I really appreciate you watching. If you're interested in checking out more Odroid boards or single board computers in general, I'm going to leave a link to Ameridroid in the description. 
And if you want to stay up to date with the Odroid H2 and what this thing can do, go ahead and subscribe to my channel. I might even have an extra one to give away in a couple days. If you could, hit that like button. And like always, thanks for watching.